welcome, welcome. This is Dave Rogers, and I have an incredible honor to be visiting with Dr. George Blair West. And how are you today, George? Dave, I couldn't be better, and thanks very much for having me on. Well, fantastic. And uh, maybe you could just share a little bit of where you are today and a little bit about yourself, and why did you write your first book? Okay, important things first. Um, yeah, I'm sitting here on my patio in Brisbane, Australia, uh, Southern Hemisphere. I know your background reflects where you are, zero degrees you, you've mentioned. Um, here it's about 33 degrees and it's a yeah, warm summer's day Beautiful. as we typically get this time of year, hoping it doesn't trigger too many bushfires this year. Last year was a horrendous year for bushfires. But yes, yeah, so you wanna know about uh, what, what brought me to write The Way of the Quest? Yeah, a little bit about yourself and, and when we, actually I interviewed you in Singapore a little bit about the way of the quest. I just received it and, and I went through it very quickly and you introduced me to some wonderful characters. And so yes, I'd love to hear a little bit about your background and then how that came into your existence. Sure. So it all came out of, interestingly, the first book I wrote, which was uh, called Weight Loss for Food Lovers. The psychology and sabotage of weight loss it was all about the psychology of trying to lose weight and how people end up sabotaging and out of that 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 that, that book did very well it got me um, a whole pile of international interest i started running some workshops for health professionals teaching them about that psychology as you know your listeners don't but i, I started life as a medical doctor specialized in psychiatry and so I had, a, I guess, a, a, an angle on, on weight loss that nobody had really written about before. And that was, you know, a really exciting space to be operating in, to be the first one to bring. Now there's quite a few books on, on psychology, mindfulness, and so on. But out of the workshops that I ran, uh, it was a two-day workshop. And one of the things that, had occurred, that, 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 that I'd, I'd seen for my clinical work was that for a lot of people, eating food alcohol was a very meaningful part of their life. And one of the things that you realize when you delve into this psychology is you can't take things away unless you put something else in that space. Otherwise you fail. It's one of the reasons why diets fail. Right? So I was you know, working with this with my patients clinically and looking at what else we would put there instead of food. Because when you wake up and the thing you look forward to the most in the day is eating, you've got a really big problem. Right. And often that reflected the fact that their, their life just wasn't that meaningful. Yes. It wasn't that purposeful. It wasn't that rewarding. So I, I worked this up into the workshops and in the workshops, and these are workshops for health professionals, you know, doctors, psychologists, nurses, dietitians. And in, in, on day two, I would ask the audience, I would say, you know, how do you guys find meaning and purpose? Because you've got to have something there to fill that space. Otherwise, you know, it's got to compete with the food. And I, I was surprised at how many of these professionals would talk about, particularly the, the females, about having children to give them meaning and purpose in life. And I had to stop and say, look, I'm really sorry about this, but you can't use children to give you meaning and purpose in life. I know it seems intuitively like that's an answer to the question, but it isn't. Now, children, it, having children is something that we do. It's, we're genetically endowed to, you know, propagate the species. So, you know, that's not going to fit into this space, which is very much a conscious choosing questing process. And we can talk about why it's a quest and not a question in a, in a bit. And so, yeah, I had to say to these people, look, no, children, you can't do that to them. Because the other problem is, is if you make children your meaning and purpose, you put this huge burden on them. Think about that. We've got to go through life and work out our own meaning and purpose. But if you're looking after your parents' meaning and purpose at the same time, that's, that's a real challenge. So, and it's a burden that you don't want to give your children. And when they, I think when people stop and think about that, they get it. And of course, the other big problem with kids, well, it's actually not a problem, it's actually good news because I've had two of them, <laughs> they've both done this. They leave home. Yes. You know, and they leave home when we're sort of in our midlife, just in time to bring in our midlife crisis. Because, you know, that's the, you know, midlife crisis is basically the point in our life that we get to where we go, is my life meaningful and purposeful? And it can come, we can come at it from two angles. We, we may have actually achieved everything that we'd set out to achieve. And we might wake up and find out that it's actually not that meaningful and not that rewarding for us. 
or of course we may not have achieved what we'd set out to achieve and then we've got a different problem and this is the backbone you know people tend to reflect on this when they get halfway through their adult life because you know you're halfway you've gone right now i'm looking at the last half and all of a sudden time starts to close in so you know that was what got me thinking about writing about meaning and purpose and i used to refer people to Puello Coelho's book, The Alchemist, which is a lovely metaphorical novel about this kid on this journey to make sense of the world. But a lot of people would read it and would come back and say, yeah, that's a really great book, but how do I work up my meaning purpose in life? So that's why I wrote The Way of the Quest. And to go back to my earlier comment, the reason why it's a quest and not a question is because you can't answer this quickly. So if you think of it, so many people say to me, yeah, but I don't know what to do to make my life meaningful. And I say, well, that's because it's a quest, not a question. And the problem, if we, if we get those two things confused, if we think it's a question, we're taught at school that if we've got a question in front of us that we can't answer, then we're dumb. We're stupid. So we don't like holding a question in our mind that we don't know the answer to. So what I would watch people do is they, in front of me, they'd start saying, yeah, I get that I've got to put my meaning purpose life, but I don't know what that is. Okay. And they just start to move on. And I go, no, 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 hold on, hold on. It took me, I'd say probably 10 years from when I started wanting to work out what I incarnated into this life to do, to get a handle on it and really start to, to build a life around that. 10 years. Yeah, when you think about a quest, you know, the knight doesn't, you know, get his squires up early in the morning and get his shiny suit of armor on and, and, and get them to bring out his best steed and, and the mule to bring the, the, the stuff they need for their quest and head off and expect to be home by nightfall. No, they're going for the next two summers to find their holy grail. And that's the nature of a quest. You know, it's a big trip. Mm -hmm. And you've got to head off on it. And that's the, I guess, and, and when you try and work out, okay, well, what do I do on that big trip? That's why I wrote The Way of the Quest. So it's, it's a metaphorical story as well. In the style of The Alchemist, again, we've got a 16-year-old kid. I don't know how old um, Puello Coelho's protagonist was, but he's off. And this is set in Elizabethan times, had a lot of time, a lot of fun spending time in, in the UK and in France. You know where the book is set on the magical Mont Saint-Michel. Uh, just off the coast of France, which has got an amazing history to it, as, as I know you know. And that was just, when I spent time there, that was just so inspiring. I thought this is, a, this is it's one of those, those books where the, the geographical setting is a character in the story. Well, I, I took so many things away from the book. It, it was not only the fact that it was in Mont Saint-Michel, which again, we both have been there. And uh, again, one of the major characters, Francis Bacon, Sir Francis Bacon, arguably one of the smartest men who ever walked on this planet. Um, yes, undoubtedly, uh, he, he, he was a polymath. He was one of the half a dozen polymaths that we can speak to uh, from history, you know, like Leonardo da Vinci. You know. Th these guys who are not just geniuses in one area, like Einstein or Newton, but are geniuses in multiple areas. So one of the themes I pick up on in the book is that a true master is somebody who is able to look beyond their own area and apply these principles of mastery to multiple areas in life. Yes. You know, it, it, somebody who's very good at, at making money, for example, isn't going to get my vote unless they're also very good at something else. Right. Nothing wrong with making money, but if you, if that's your singularity and you, you know, and of course the other, the most important one I think is being the master of relationships. You know, we've got to be able to, develop strong, tight relationships with partners, friends, family. And, and that, that, that's a very important form of mastery. So yes, polymaths have always interested me, you know, because they have this, they seem to have an underlying sense of the way things really work. And they can apply that to very different areas. So yes, Francis Bacon, as, as you know, is the front runner for who Shakespeare really was, because it clearly wasn't the guy from Stratford-on-Avon. When you look at his education, his training, his career, you know, and what he wrote about, he wrote about things that you could only write about if you were in the middle of the Elizabethan court and then the court of, of, of St. James, of, of King James. 
and Bacon lived in that world. Right. But anyway, that's a whole other story. And, and one of the problems with the book, if I can put it that way, is that that story kind of, for a lot of people, takes over well, the allegorical sort of point of the book, which was, so I've had people say they read the book twice, once to follow the story, <laughs> and then the other one to go back and, and, and look for all of the points that I've embedded in the story that are about the quest and how you work out what your meaning and purpose in life is. What's, uh, again, I, I love the fact that we could talk about it. And, and one of the key points that you're talking about today, which is so relevant for people, it's, it's the question, the question, and what that can do for somebody. If, they're, if it's just a question and immediately, like so many people, they're, they've been programmed to say, I don't know, and therefore they sit in the vortex. And it's often a, a self-defecating vortex. And then if and, it's and a well, quest, well, well, they give up on it. Yeah. Correct. Nobody likes sitting with a question they don't know the answer to. So then the quest is more of that journey, uh, which again, we could go into a, a nice conversation about the journey, uh, Joseph Campbell's journey, the, the hero's journey, which for me has been a, such a great influence over the last three or four years. Yeah, that and was then, a wonderful piece of work, that book by Campbell. And then we're, when we're talking now with uh, Sir Francis Bacon, again, today I would like to just ask you the question, see what you come up with is that, if you were really to distill the, the, the quest, the way of the quest down to a key takeaway that, as we know, most people, when they get a book, they don't read the whole thing yet. What would, what would be the, the element that really can be a takeaway for 2020? So once you understand it is a quest and, and that you're going to be spending years working it out. So it's got to just sit in the back of your mind from that premise then what I say to people is you go through life, look at everything you have done and everything that you're doing and look at the things that, in fact, it's easier to look at the things you definitely don't want to do, you don't find meaningful and, and, and cross them off the list. It's often easier to do that when people try to ask this question of how do, how do I shape a life that's you know, got maximum you know, meaning for me? So we look at the things we definitely don't like doing. They're pretty easy to identify. But then the trick is to look at the things that you've done and the things that you're doing that you look forward to doing. That when you reflect, excuse me, when you reflect on your day, they're the things that give you the little dopamine release of feeling like you've, that, that was a good day, you know, or what I was doing there was, was good work. And then we look back, a lot of people tell me, oh, but I wasted my life because I did this degree and I started in this career and then I realized I didn't like it. I said, no, 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 that was really important. The number of times I see people when they finally work out their meaning and purpose, using elements of what they did early on, even though, and, and you're a great example of this. I know a bit of your, your amazing story. You know, you, you, you worked in, in, in Canada, then you went to Japan, if I recall correctly, was it? Mm -hmm. And you worked as a, as a hedge fund broker or that sort of um, high powered sort of space. And then you went on a whole different path of, of personal development, running workshops and, and what, what you're doing now. But I have no doubt that that early, that those early career experiences still inform an aspect of what you do now. Would I be right? Absolutely. Again, it's, uh, it's taking those really tough times and, finding the gem out of it instead of sitting in the sea of blameness seeing it as the opportunity to understand an awareness of compassion or an understanding or an awareness of empathy and so those days of the 20s where we had the night terrors and we had the suicidal thoughts and we had the poster syndrome are serving me now so much as i doing work with the elderly or i'm doing it work with uh, men's heartbreak and it's just those experiences are irreplaceable because they've created this opportunity to bridge with people through empathy and compassion right, and yeah. as a bond <laughs> trainer who everything was about timing today so much of my life is about patience yes yes that's right and of course i think we both appreciate that the lovely yin and yang of that because having been in that in, in that space you really understand where you don't want to be. And that's as valuable as if you'd, in fact, I suspect it's way more valuable than if you were amazingly able to luck onto your, you know, most rewarding journey from the day you step out of high school. 
which I don't really think happens because you've got to have this, this, this journey. So yes, it's a, if, if I was to distill it down, it's, we've got to you know, start with that premise that it's a quest, not a question. And then we've got to just be slowly, quietly reviewing and looking at the things that we want to do more of and the things we want to do less of and how we can encapsulate that, particularly if we can ca capture it within work. If you get paid to do you know, what is meaningful and rewarding to you as I do, that's just wonderful. I, I feel incredibly blessed to be able to, to you know, go to my practice and because I've narrowed it down to the, the couple of areas that I really want to work in. I only work two and a half days a week. So I always look forward to starting work at nine o'clock on a Wednesday morning because I've, you know, it, it's not a lot of my life. And then the rest of the time I'm pursuing other interests and, you know, particularly writing where I get to play with words and ideas and, and try and capture them in a way that other people will find of value. So, but that took me again, I'm, I'm 60 years old now and I probably got that life worked out. I've probably been doing it pretty much like that for 15, you know, so do the maths. This wasn't something that, you know, I just worked out quickly. Actually, I might share with you, which is a nice way of distilling the book down, the one question that I found the most helpful. You know, we're familiar with these kinds of questions. You know, if you had a you know, million dollars and, and didn't have to work, not, not that a million dollars is enough any, anymore. Right. If you had $20 million yeah. and you didn't have to work, how would you spend your time? Right. Th these are nice questions. But the question I like the most is this one. Let's say you get diagnosed with a terminal illness and you see your doctor and the doctor says you have 12 months of good health left before you are going to become unwell. What would you do in those 12 months before you were not going to be well enough to do whatever you wanted to do? And I think that's just a spectacularly beautiful question because you see a lot of people, when you say, well, if you had cancer and you were going to die, what would you do in your remaining health? They say, well, I've, travel the world and I spend it with my loved ones, you know, you can't do that for 12 months. 12 months is too long. You know, you can, you can do a six week around the world trip, which I found, you know, about week five and a half, I want to go home, you know, because I'm sick of living out of even nice hotels, you know, it, 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 it's not worth it. And, and yeah, you, you can spend a lot of time with friends and family, but you can't spend the remaining, you know, 11, 10 and a half months with them, you know, 12 months means you've got to think about what would you do? What would be the most, and of course, the other part of that question, the final point of it is, whatever the answer to that is, that's how you construct your life around that, such that when we get the news, if we're lucky enough, sometimes life spins on a dime, that we have 12 months of good health left, have you set your life up to live that in the best possible way? And so every year I would ask my, my, myself that question, am I living the, how is my life different from what I would like it to look like if I had 12 months of good health. And now at this point in my life, I can say, if I had 12 months of good health left, what would I do differently? Nothing. Exactly. I, I, I already take, you know, six, eight weeks holidays a year to spend with my you know, friends and family. I see lots of my, my, my kids. My wife reckons I see too much of her because, you know, I don't work that much. You know, it, 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 I literally wouldn't change anything. I, you know, what I've got planned for the next 12 months, I'd probably do exactly that. Exactly. Yeah, that's, so, what, that's an invitation for people to really look at 21 to start getting into that flow. And the other thing is maybe allow themselves the time to work towards it. So the first time might be two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, yet they're also given the opportunity now to be that co-designer of their life. Yeah, that, that's so true. And, and I think the other point that falls out of what you're, you're saying there, Dave, is that you've got to be comfortable with taking a long-term time perspective on this issue. It's the most important thing I believe we have to work out in life next to having meaningful relationships. Now, Freud said that happiness comes from basically Arbeiten und Lieben, you know, working and loving. And that's a pretty neat summary of how we find happiness, you know? And by, I, I just changed working a little bit to, you know, pursuing your meaning and purpose in life, right? But yeah, so my phone went off, then I'll say that again. But I, I, I would just change the um, Arbeiten part to, to rather than just straight work, doing something that you find meaningful and, and purposeful. Let, let me uh, get you to, because you talked a little bit about it, because you 
said that this book came out of you. It, it took a number of years to perturbate. What advice would you give to an aspiring author or somebody who wants to be an author? Yes, you know, I've, I've been writing all my life. I, I published my first article, which they put on the front page of a mother and baby magazine when my daughter was 18 months old. She's now 30. So I, I know how long I've been writing for. And it took half, 15 years before I, I started. I actually wrote a book before that with my wife that we had an offer to publish, but we didn't publish because they want us to t wanted us to take out all of the reference to the science. And the whole book was all about the science of child of raising children and, and child discipline, because if you're going to go in that space, you needed to back it up. With stuff. Anyway, that's, that's another story. But the, 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 the advice I was kind of given is if you think you're a writer, write. And if you're not writing, you're not a writer. And so if you write and you're continually writing as I was, I was writing short stories, I was writing articles, I wrote some scientific papers. What happens is you are refining your craft all the time in your head. And in exactly the same way as we're talking about going on a quest to find your meaning and purpose, what starts to happen is over time, your mind converges on what is going to be the most important thing that you can write about. And I'll let those jet skis go past because I'm on the river here. Um, what you write about, it's got to be something that is meaningful to you. I feel for authors who feel very strongly about subjects that aren't particularly popular. But we don't really have a choice. We have to write and we have to write about stuff that's meaningful to us. And, you know, history is replete with authors who what they wrote wasn't relevant at the time, but went on to become something that was that, that, that lived through the ages. You know, you think, think of the, 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 the writers in, in Roman and Greek times that we still read today. I'm sure Plato and Socrates have been read a lot more. Well, Socrates actually never wrote very much at all. I don't think there's no, there's no book by Socrates. You've got to read the other writers at the time to know the way he thought. And Plato, of course, was, was you know, one of those sources. But, but yeah, they've been read a lot more since they were dead than they were ever while they were alive. So we, we've got to take some solace in that. But if I was going to give any aspiring writers one key thought, it is that I, I've struggled over the years because I've, I've been torn between writing what I think the world most needs to be helped with, which comes from my work as a doctor and as a psychiatrist, and what I want to write about that's most interesting to me. And those two things often aren't aligned. Right. And I took a decision a while back that I'm just going to write for my soul. I'm going to write, I actually wrote a little, you know, when I was caught with this point, because I wasn't writing so much because I was kind of caught between writing what I thought the world needed and what I really wanted to write about. And I didn't have alignment. And so that was a less productive time in my life. And I just, yeah, I woke up one day, you know, dealing with this quandary. Actually, it was after I did a mushroom trip with my daughter at one point too, asking the same question about, you know, what should I do? And, and you know, the, the, the mushrooms gave me a very clear message that take your time, slow down. You're not here to save the world. It can look after itself. So the, 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 the message that came and that I'm now probably more productive. I've got two books in the pipeline with a big international publisher next year. Uh, and that's because I just let the universe take me where I wanted to go and it showed me how to do it in a way that was of some relevance to other folks. And that has been a wonderful, wonderful sort of journey to, to be on that, where, where I've been fortunate in that what I want to write about, what speaks to my soul that really fascinates me at this point in time, well, it's at least something a publisher thinks is a, is a, good, a good idea. Now, how, are, how can people get a hold of your books would be one question. The other is, tell us a little bit about the upcoming books that you're working on. Sure. Look, the easiest way is if they just jump on Amazon, uh, you can download the Kindle version of The Way of the Quest. You can um, order it. It's available in, in the UK and America and Australia as a hard copy. Uh, but it takes ages to get to people versus Kindle is there. Uh, so... That's the easiest way to do it. And just go to Amazon and it's there and you just, just, just download it. Um, 
yeah, so this year or 2021, I've got two books uh, coming up with Hachette. The one I'm really excited about, I'm excited about both of them, but they're very different books. Uh, it, in Valentine's week next year, I've got a book that I've co-authored with my daughter. It's a book I started seven, eight years ago now. And it kind of got lost there for a while because the book's called How to Make the Biggest Decision of Your Life, which is choosing a life partner. And when I started talking about that subject, you know, baby boomers, my generation, I'm the, I'm the sort of last of the baby boomers, and then Generation X were the first of the you know, divorced culture. Uh, they don't believe that you choose partners. They see it as what I call a, a function of romantic destiny. And so they didn't see why, you'd, how, how would, why would you read a book on how to choose a partner? And it, it got shelved until I gave a TED talk and I spoke briefly about the TED talk. It's not the TED talk that I like to go. That was a result of this brief one minute talk I, I gave. And when I was leaving, these two millennials just grabbed me. I, I spoke to one of them and they said, by the way, what, how do you choose a, a good partner that, and prevent divorce? Because it was all about preventing divorce. And these two girls, they were 18, 19, took out their, their phones and just started taking notes of everything I was talking about. And I realized something profound that millennials, are, they're two generations into a, into a divorce-ready culture. They get it. They're sick of divorce. You know, it's not the whole finding the one and staying married is a baby boomer concept. And, the, and Gen, Gen X kind of thought, yeah, that, that's probably the way it works. But millennials go bullshit. And millennials are the most informed generation we've ever had, or except for the ones coming after them, whatever they're called now. I think they're Gen Z next. But yeah, the... the that, that, that was just something. So anyway, my daughter got on board after these girls and the, the, te, the, the, TED, the TEDx um, manager watched me talking to these girls, went and spoke to them afterwards, invited me back to give a TED talk next year because of their interest. That TED talk was picked up by TED.com in New York, three and a half million views later. You know, it's a thing. Okay. So that's coming out in for Valentine's. Yeah, I mean, our Valentine's week in, 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 so it's a launch, it's launching in Australia, but it'll be on Amazon. And so people will be able to get it around the world and we'll probably do hopefully a, a launch in, in, in America. Fantastic. And the other book? And, and the other book um, came out of the work I did with one of my patients who's got DID that was, she was featured on 60 Minutes in 2019. They ended up uh, doing the entire show on her because Sorry, it was such a DID? Dissociative Identity Disorder or Multiple Personality Disorder, as, as it used to be called. And it's a fascinating case because it's the first time in, they, they said it was the history of Australia, but we believe it's the first time in the history of the world that somebody with DID is actually given evidence in court on the side of the prosecution. Because you only get DID pretty much if you've been molested from a young age, pretty horrendously for many years which means there's a very serious perpetrator out there behind a person with DID. And so she had her father extradited from England. It was a nine year case and it took it to court and she gave evidence, her different alters gave evidence. So I, I, I was the first expert witness and I had to teach the judge how DID worked and how to, what to expect and how the different alters would come forward. The judge was fantastic. She, she was a very good student. Uh, they didn't actually have a jury because her, the material was just too distressing to run in front of 12 people. It would have, we would have had 12 traumatized jurors. But anyway, so that, so that book, um, I'm co-authoring that with her. Uh, and that book comes out later in the year. Wow. Sounds like a, a, a wonderful unfolding in 2021. Uh, it continues to be your quest in your journey. Um, what has been a, a, learning or discovery in 2020 that you'd like to share with uh, our listeners as we bring uh, this session to a, a nice completion? You know, Dave, that's, that's, that's a really um, good question because 2020 has been a year of adversity and it's actually piqued my interest in adversity. So I've been in the back of my mind as I'm researching, because I love researching as much as I enjoy writing. It's something, a little tip for writers who have a similar approach maybe to mine. If I want to fire my, I, I don't really have writer's block, but if I really want to get motivated, I pick a subject to research. And as I'm researching, going deeper and deeper. So what I've been researching this year, just in, when I come across it is adversity and why adversity is good for us and how it's good for us. And of course this pandemic, 
has really given us spectacular examples of that. So, so some of the ways in which adversity are good for us, adversity gets us to get in touch with parts of ourselves we would never have otherwise discovered. Now think about that. You know, we're talking about the hero's journey. Heroes express themselves, come to be in the face of adversity. No mm. adversity, no heroes. The, the, so, the, the known to the unknown, the pits, the perils, the problems. Yes. So what adversity does is it mobilizes our inner hero, which is really cool. Another thing that it does is it gets us to work out who our friends really are. And that's new. That, that's, that's painful news at times, but it's really important news because as we go through life and we invest decades in our friendships, you want to know which ones to put that energy into. And it's pretty sad when you've got a friend of 20 years when the chips are down and they just walk out on you or they don't show up. And then somebody who you've known more peripherally shows up. And you go, wow, this is really, this is really cool. This person really genuinely cares. And now I know because they're actually stepping up in these difficult times. So think about that. That's another really cool benefit from adversity. And, and the third one that comes to mind, you know, there's quite a few of these that I've been playing with, but you know, the third one that comes along is that we of course become, people who've been through adversity are much more empathic than people who haven't, which kind of, when you stop and think about it, makes kind of sense. You know, people who had a dream run and a dream life and had everything given to them, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's, that's wonderful for them at one level, except for maybe this problem, which is that they're not very good at empathizing with people who've done it tough. And that can really disconnect them, I think, from potential connections and friendships that can be incredibly rewarding. So when you start to drill down on adversity, you know, in 2020, the year of adversity, particularly here in Australia, because we had this horrible bushfire season at the beginning of this year. And that meant that, you know, we had oh, thousands of square miles of this country devastated. And it wasn't scrub. This was you know, people's, this was villages and towns and, and, and we had, you know, I think it was 30 people who died. It was horrific. And, and then we just get over that and the pandemic arrives. So it has been a year of adversity, but we grow more through adversity than we ever do through things, go, things going well. You know, the things that I have learned from the adversity in my life, I, I, I don't really want to put my hand up and say more adversity, please. Thank you, universe. But when I look back on it, I know that it's been really, really important in shaping me to be a better person. In fact, one of the sayings that I've, it's in, it, I've put all of my sort of most pithy and important sort of sayings into the way of the quest. And one of them I, I, I know I played with quite a bit in there was the saying that uh, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. And wisdom is built on experience. Ergo, you only build wisdom if you don't get what you want. And that's, that's been proven to me. It's a kind of a summary of everything we've just spoken about. Beautiful. Wonderful summary. It, yeah. It, it, when you put it together that way, when, when, when shit's not working out, that time, deep down I've learned to go, okay, this is going to be important. I don't quite know how yet. Right. But this is going to be significant. So you get to this point, and you know one of the other big ideas I played with in the book was the relationship between good and evil, which I see more as a yin and yang than a valued good and bad. Oh, yes. you know, and for this kind of reason, you know, it's only when you get a good devil in the room that you get the opportunity for a hero to, to come, right. on, come and meet him. So without devils, you can't have heroes. Right. So again, I've kind of learned to see the world in a very different way from how a lot of people see it. They get a bit, they think I'm a bit weird when I talk about how, you know, I don't see bad things as bad. Right. It's finding the flow. Things. It's actually honoring the flow, honoring the Tao, honoring the, the light from the darkness. And that's something that really few people can really distill when they do though, transformational right away. And I know it's something you and I have had, had really lovely conversations about these things over the years. And I know you absolutely get that. And I hope that people listening to this can join us in understanding that because it changes. It is transformational because it means the world we live in isn't, there isn't actually a bad part to it. It just is. 
And for people who think that this is really, really bad, that's a really energetically unhappy place to be. Whereas when you see that's the contrast to things when they go swimmingly and you can't have one without the other, you can't have day without night, you can't have good without evil, you can't have adversity without good times. We wouldn't be able to experience joy if the whole time everything was going joyfully. So yes, when you get the fullness of it, I believe you're, it's a good word you've used. It is transformational because it's a way, it's something we can bring to day-to-day -day life that changes what a lot of other people find overwhelming. Well, George, thank you so very much. I wish you and the family the very best uh, festive season. And, and for any of our listeners, please check out George's books on Amazon. Uh, reach out, leave a comment, share it, and... Uh, you have a great uh, completion to 2020 and look forward to chatting with you in 2021. And I wish you all the very best too, Dave, you and your family over there.